Steel jobs are saved. The plans to stop stalkers and the big pharma company fined for fleecing the NHS. You're watching 5 News tonight. A deal is struck to save Tata Steel and the jobs of thousands of people. The government plans to tackle stalking, including restricting the internet for perpetrators. And Pfizer is fined after raising the price of an epilepsy medicine by more than 2,500%. Also tonight, Sir Ranulph Fiennes talks to us from the bottom of the world. Britain's most intrepid living explorer has scaled Antarctica's highest peak on his way to climbing the biggest mountain on each continent. Plus... If every day was Christmas and I can be with you... Beckham's Got Talent, youngest son Cruz reveals his debut Christmas single on social media, but at 11, is it too much too soon? Good evening, welcome to 5 News Tonight. I'm Matt Barbette. They've endured months of uncertainty about their futures, but today thousands of workers for Tata Steel have been told their jobs are safe. After talks with unions, the Indian firm made a series of commitments, including a guarantee of steelmaking at Port Talbot for at least five years. Union members do still have to agree on the deal in a ballot, but it could secure the jobs for 8,000 workers in South Wales and right across the UK. From Port Talbot, Dominic Reynolds has more. This year, in this town, they've needed nerves of steel. For 10 months, the future of the plant Port Talbot is built around has been unknown. Owner Tata said it wanted out of UK steel making back at the start of the year. Now weeks before the end of 2016, it's made a deal to stay and keep up to 4,000 people in work. What this has done is secured uh, production to furnaces for a period that then gives us time to, uh, to plan and reflect and make sure that the union is still in there fighting for, for continued production after that. Kevin spent 34 years on the production line here. He's relieved he's keeping his job, but he doesn't know how long for. You can't think long term. I mean, I, I've just gone out and done a, a private course streaming license. That's how much confidence I've got in the place. I've You're paid preparing for, my own. for another job? Yes. I've paid, I've paid for a course streaming license myself. That's how much confidence I've got. When do you think you'll need to use it? When they say they're going to close the place. So you think it's when, not if? Yeah. This Kevin's also pleased to be keeping the job he's had since the 80s, but he isn't celebrating. He's worried pensions are being traded in to keep the plant open. You know, I hope they, they don't take, take things off uh, the pension. That's my uh, hardened view. And there are a lot of uh, boys in there at the moment, like, who got a lot of service in. You know, we worked hard for this pension. You know what I mean? A long time, 20 years, 30 years, and people there longer. So giving that yeah, pension up no, won't feel like a win? No, no, not at all, not at all. Changes to pensions are part of the proposed deal and the agreement only looks as far as five years ahead. But for workers who once thought they might be unemployed this Christmas, this is good news for now. Well, just a bit earlier on, Dominic told us what happens next. So some of the details that we've been hearing about this proposed plan, there is a five-year guarantee of making steel with two blast furnaces at the plant behind me. But Tata has also unveiled a 10-year investment plan, which is worth a billion pounds, they say. But Tata, speaking this evening, admitted 2016 has been tough. The, these were troubling, uh, troubling times, and it has been extremely difficult time for everybody, losing a lot of money. Uh, the tailwinds that we see now were not predicted. Uh, but most importantly, our employees have really, really worked hard on a turnaround plan. So what happens now? Well, the unions have to vote on this proposed plan until it's put into action. That's likely to happen with a ballot in January, I'm told. And it seems it's likely the sticking point will be those changes to pensions. But one way or another, all over Port Talbot tonight, people are breathing a sigh of relief. Now, stalkers could have their access to the internet restricted as part of plans to stop the problem before it gets out of hand. Police will get new powers to stop people contacting strangers or acquaintances online, even if they haven't yet been arrested or charged. Breaching the rules could land them a five-year prison sentence. Peter Lane has more details. OK, how long has this been happening for you? Helplines, charities and the police are dealing with more reports of stalking than ever. 
And has this person ever destroyed or vandalised any of your other property? Just four years after stalking was made a specific criminal offence, the Home Secretary has launched stalking protection orders, which can be triggered before any arrests or criminal proceedings begin. An example might be stopping them hanging around outside the house. It might be not having access to their computer. This will be a good way of stopping things becoming much more serious. It's a way for the police to act before things escalate because sometimes they really can escalate in a terrible way. One in five women and one in ten men will be stalked at some point in their lives. Almost 14,000 calls have been made to the National Helpline since it was launched six years ago. And in the 12 months to June, police recorded more than 4,000 stalking offences, an increase of 32% on the previous year. He had cameras in the house that we shared together. He had a camera watch with a microphone on as well. He put a tracker in my car. He would blow smoke through my door in the middle of the night. Um, he put footprints in the snow when it snowed, leading to and from the house. We're protecting this woman's identity and we'll call her Sarah. She knows the impact of stalking and likes the sound of the new protection orders, but does have questions. It's concerning because is it just a shop window? Is it something that looks brilliant on a headline? Have we got the resource to back it up? Have we got the professionals who are being trained on the new? orders, do the victims know what they're really going to do? It means you are forced to change your life routine for months or even years. With ads like this, there's even more awareness now of stalking, giving more people confidence to report it. But as Sarah knows, long after it's stopped, the impact is still there. No one should live in fear and no one should be trapped in their own home. It is very much like a life sentence because you always have to look over your shoulder. Well, that was Peter Lane speaking to one victim of stalking. With me now is Tracy Morgan, who was stalked for years by a former colleague of hers, and also Rachel Griffin, director of the victim support group, the Susie Lamplew Trust. Good evening to you both. Tracy, just remind us briefly what happened to you. Yeah, my, my stalking um, situation started uh, way back in 1992. Uh, it started with following, watching, and at that time the word stalking wasn't even in you know, anywhere in the UK. Um, and so I thought I was going mad. I was made to think I was going mad. Um, and it, ha it took nearly 10 years um, to eventually um, get him in prison, uh, sadly, for attempted murder of another woman. Yes, for a different thing. And, and in that time, it pretty much ruined your life. You ended up taking sleeping pills, antidepressants, your marriage fell apart. So it begs the question, would these new plans the government have talked about today made a difference in your situation? I'd like to think they would. I mean, it's acknowledgement that actually, um, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, nearly half of all stalking cases are ex-partners, where that means over half are not. Mm. Mine wasn't an ex-partner. Um, therefore, I was, I'd be less likely to fall through the cracks um, of the legal system. Um, it would have been taken seriously. It would have, um, put things in place to try and stop his behaviour at an early stage, which is what was needed, really. Um, sadly, I think it might be um, too late now. Tr Tracy, but, cautiously, oh, sorry to interrupt there, Tracy, cautiously optimistic. Is that what, how you feel about this, Rachel? Pretty much, yes. Um, and we're excited about the, the proposals and we think there are a few things about them which are particularly good. For example, that, um, that, that they are to be police-led so that it takes the onus off the victim who at the moment may have to take out an injunction, potentially at their own cost. Mm. Um, we like the fact that they allow for positive obligations to be placed upon the stalker, okay. which could be something like attending some form of um, intervention around their behaviour. Um, but I think the, the, the test of this will be um, putting training in place so that police officers can recognise stalking when it's presented to them. Um, too often we hear from victims on the helpline who have reported to the, to the police but haven't had a very satisfactory response. If the person doing this, the perpetrator, breaks the rules, they get five years in prison. But are they really thinking about that when they're doing what they're doing? Tracy, what do you think? Are they thinking whether it's five years, five months or five days in prison? Is it going to stop them? Um, it, it's a tool to help them mm. perhaps come to their senses before it gets to beyond that point. Mm. Um, we're talking about obsessed, fixated people here. If we can 
stop it at an earlier stage, the, you know, the ch more, better chance it has of stopping. Um, but it is just, as, as Rachel said, just one tool. You know, we need to look at mental health, support, personality disorders. You know, 16 years ago, I, I started asking for a register of stalkers because there are so many things, other elements that we need to look at. And that's the thing, Rachel, just to finish, isn't it? It's trying to stop it earlier, but what if there are people, men and women, in Tracy's situation where it's got way out of hand? There's enough being done there to stop the chronic problems of stalking that still exist? I think the lack of provision um, for uh, mental health interventions is a real problem. Um, so for many victims, like Tracy will say, that prison is really just respite because what they know is at the moment that a stalker comes out, they'll be back looking for them again. So, you know, long, where we do, in the, sorry, in the relatively few cases where we do have a longer sentence, um, we'd really look to be able to make use of that sentence to, to do some proper mental health assessment and hopefully intervention to get that behaviour stopped. OK, step in the right direction, but nothing more. More than that, I think. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Labour's shadow Brexit secretary, Sir Keir Starmer, has told Parliament that there is no mandate for a hard Brexit. He was speaking during a Commons debate over the government's timetable for leaving the European Union. Tonight's MPs will vote on the Prime Minister's plan to trigger Article 50 in March next year. Meanwhile, police have arrested a man in connection with threats made to Gina Miller. She's the businesswoman spearheading the Brexit legal challenge. Ms Miller says she received racist messages following her decision to take the government to court. And after months of fighting, Syrian rebels have left the last areas they held in Aleppo's old quarter. It means government forces now control about three quarters of eastern Aleppo, areas which had been held by the rebels for the past four years. Theresa May has joined Barack Obama and other world leaders in condemning Russia over its role in the humanitarian disaster. Next, after climbing Mount Everest and trekking across both the North and South Poles, you'd forgive Sir Ranulph Fiennes for just easing back a bit on the old exploration. Well, not a bit of it. The 72-year-old has just made it to the summit of the highest mountain on Antarctica. He climbed the 16,000 feet up Mount Vincent in temperatures as low as minus 40 Celsius. It's part of his new plan to climb the highest mountain on every continent. He spoke a bit earlier on to Danny Sinha. Mount Vincent is an incredible climb for anyone, regardless of age. But Sir Ranulph Fiennes has done it. This is him pictured at base camp beforehand. So how did it go? We're very lucky to have been successful. And I won't say it was sort of easy. Yeah, we had a whole week, which was a real pain in the neck of the worst weather in the memory of any of the guides. Yeah. Um, we had 100 mile an hour oh, gusting so. winds. We had tents ripped apart. This is all part yeah, of the global the challenge. Here he is in July climbing oh, Mount there. Elbrus in Russia. Okay. We're getting there. Oh, good. I'm glad. This mission has already raised £9.6 million for Marie Curie, the charity that helped his late wife when she had cancer. At 72, he's determined not to let his age get the better of him. It's a pain in the, in the neck, this age business. Um, and then you get, you know, did Everest, I was the first OAP, and you get accusations of having been helped with a bus pass. And, uh, you know, people do take, make fun of the ageism process. Sir Ranulf thought he completed the big one when he climbed Everest and crossed both polar ice caps six years ago. But after overhearing a competitor's conversation discussing another big one, that brought him out of retirement. He's now out to finish the job, and next mountain is Argentina. It's called Aconcagua, not like the snake. And a lot of people die on it, but if they don't have a guide, that is a problem. There's rock falls, high winds, but I don't think it will be um, as difficult as the one we did last night or yesterday. Climbing mountains has its many challenges. Just three years ago, Sir Ranulph had to abandon a trip across Antarctica because he developed frostbite in his fingers. This is a man on a mission, ready to break records despite being a pensioner. Danny Sinha, Five News. Absolutely unstoppable. Now, the drugs giant Pfizer has been handed a record fine for overcharging the National Health Service. It raised the price of its anti-epilepsy drug by 2,600% overnight. Our health correspondent, Catherine Jones, is with me now. Tell us more 
about this specific drug, Cathy? Well, it's a drug that around 48,000 people rely on to prevent them getting epileptic seizures. And it used to be uh, given to them uh, with the brand name Epinutin, and it, a monthly typical supply cost £2.83 to the NHS. But in 2012, Pfizer decided to distribute it as a generic brand in the UK instead. The name changed and so did the price, to £67.50 for the same amount. Um, let me stress, the same drug was inside the packets, it's just the packets changed. Look at that rise, it's, it's eye-watering. Why did it go up by so much? It is indeed. Uh, basically, drugs that are branded, and they tend to be the more expensive ones, the NHS has some power to negotiate a good deal with the manufacturer. Generic drugs, copies that can be made by anybody, it doesn't have the same regulatory price control and so that means legitimately companies can take advantage of it that meant two million pounds a year was the cost in 2012 50 million was the cost in 2013 when the drug changed they took the opportunity of taking the drug out of price regulation which is fine and legal and then exploited that to increase prices to the nhs not by 10 percent or 25 percent but by between 780% and 2,600%. And the victims of that are the NHS and all who use the NHS because the money could be spent on other things and us all as taxpayers. So it costs the NHS millions and it's going to cost Pfizer just as much now. Well, almost as much. It's going to cost them £84 million. That is a record fine. However, Pfizer are appealing this. They're going to fight it. They say the branded version of the drug was losing them money. The price of the generic copy was still substantially cheaper than the alternatives out on the market. Now, belatedly, the government has woken up to this issue. There is actually a piece of legislation going through Parliament at the moment which would uh, begin to clamp down on any company that wants to charge the NHS uh, too much money. All right, Cathy, many thanks indeed. Still to come on Five News tonight. Helping children with life-limiting conditions. New plans to ask kids to draw up bucket lists. And Brand Beckham gets a big boost, courtesy of Cruz. We'll be talking about him after the break. Welcome back. You're watching Five News tonight. Now, how can you make a child's life as rewarding as possible when that child is facing a terminal illness? And what does that diagnosis mean for the rest of their family? It's a difficult and emotive subject, but one that around 40,000 families have to face. Well, today, the health watchdog NICE issued new guidelines to help them. Our chief correspondent, Tessa Chapman, has more. Tori Barrow's daughter, Lena, had a rare life-limiting condition. But when she was seven and her health deteriorated, there was no real plan for the end of her life. She passed away in a small hospital room with no space for her six siblings, so they couldn't say a final goodbye. People can't take that pain away, but if things had been better, it would have been more peaceful if we had perhaps been able to bring her home or have the children around her or go to hospice. And then maybe there wasn't time for that, but there would have been time to, to be there as a family. That's exactly what new guidelines from NICE on end-of-life care are seeking to avoid. On Christmas morning, we come downstairs. <laughs> Daisy Nimmo is as excited about Christmas as any other 11-year-old. Since she was diagnosed with the life-limiting Costello syndrome, she's been supported by shooting star Chase Children's Hospice, along with her brothers and sister. They feel as prepared as they can be for what's ahead. It's really important that when it is Daisy's time to go, that we do the right thing for her, that we support her, and we support her wishes, regardless of the fact that she has a learning disability, um, regardless of the fact that her care is really complicated. It's really important that we do the right thing for Daisy and, and for my other children as well. NICE wants carers and medics to talk to children about ambitions, make bucket lists even, to make end-of-life plans as individual as possible. Although it's, it's absolutely a tragic thing to happen, the, the advice we've been given is that if the situation is managed as sensitively as possible, with as much support as possible, it can provide some, some long-term comfort. No one knows how Daisy's condition will develop, 
but she knows she wants to celebrate Christmas, watch Frozen on ice and go to senior school. It's her plan and following it should help all of her family. Tessa Chapman, Five News. Now, we discussed it here last night and today it's been confirmed that Donald Trump has been named Time magazine's Person of the Year. The US president-elect said it is a great honour which meant a lot to him. He was chosen from a shortlist that included Russian President Vladimir Putin and former UKIP leader Nigel Farage. Time said the decision was straightforward. And Britain's last serving aircraft carrier is leaving Portsmouth for the final time before being torn apart and sold off for scrap. The Ministry of Defence announced early this year that HMS Illustrious had been sold for £2.1 million to a ship recycling company in Turkey. Do you recognise this young man? What if I told you that his mum is a pop star turned fashion designer? His dad was a pretty good footballer and he became a model. Oh, and that his brothers once signed for Premier League youth teams. Quite a tall order then for young Cruz Beckham to make his mark. But what do you know? He's released a Christmas single and he's not even a teenager yet. Minnie Stevenson has the story. Cruz Beckham, everybody! Yay! Now, he may only be 11, but today Cruz Beckham released his first ever single. He even sang it on the radio. If every day was Christmas and I can be with you Cruz's debut is called If Every Day Was Christmas. You could argue every day is Christmas when you're a Beckham. Today, in one of his first ever interviews, David and Victoria's son told the world the inspiration behind his song. Yeah, it's amazing. It's two of my favourite things, singing and Christmas. Yeah. And it's... <laughs> oh, that's so cute. <laughs> And it's amazing to put them together and the money's going to charity. Dad even made a brief cameo. Uh, you must be really proud of him, David. Really proud. I mean, he's having fun, he's enjoying it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, of course follows the artist formerly known as Posh. Although Victoria recently admitted in an interview that as a Spice Girl they would often turn off her mic and just let the others sing. And I sure would like some sweet as for Cruz's solo career, this his first Instagram post of him singing has been watched nearly 400,000 times. It's thought the singer's already been signed by Justin Bieber's manager. The, the Beckham family are so hardworking and have, you know, tried their hand at so many things. We've seen Victoria go from a Spice Girl to a successful fashion designer. And now it's the children who are having a stab at fame and, and giving it a go. Recently, the Beckham kids have been busy. Eldest, 17-year-old Brooklyn, is releasing his own photography book. 14-year-old Romeo is already a Burberry model. And at five, Harper is naturally making a name for herself with the front row fashion brigade. If every day was Christmas... As for Cruz's single, the bookies are already predicting it could be Christmas number one. Minnie Stevenson, Five News. As an earworm, if ever I heard one. So, is being a child star all it's cracked up to be? With me now is Molly Rainford, who was a finalist in Britain's Got Talent in 2012, and alongside her is Bonnie Breen, who's founder of the modelling and casting agency Bonnie and Bessie. Lovely to see you both. And Molly, you were 11 when you were on Britain's Got Talent back oh, then. Nice. You decided to take, well, not take a back seat from celebrity because you went on to um, performing arts school, but when you were 11, did you think this is all a bit too much too soon? Um, I think when I was 11, I thought about doing singing as a career, as a job in my future. So I think my parents definitely um, helped guide me and say, look, how about you find who you are first? Yeah. A little bit more, I Be guess. Be a bit sensible about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And so you're sponsored by a big record label through Sylvia Young School, which is a very well-known school. Mm -hmm. Now you're 16, are you glad that you've waited a bit longer? Yeah, definitely. I mean, after the show, it was it was the best thing that could have happened to me. I mean, Sony have just been so helpful. And, and to be able to go to a school that is specifically made for something that you want to do is just the best thing. I don't think I'd survive in a normal school now. So it worked <laughs> out well, but was it a bit overwhelming being on Britain's Got Talent, getting all that attention, the like of which young Cruz is getting now? Um, 
I think I didn't really know how big it was. So at 11, I was just kind of loving it, really. But um, no, I, I just kind of took everything like a pinch of salt. Bonnie, what's your take on this? I mean, clearly it's slightly different for, for the young Beckham. Yeah, and he's got a mum and dad who've been through all this and yeah. we certainly know the pitfalls and the potential backlashes. But, yeah. I mean, I imagine you'd like him on your books, wouldn't you? Yeah, oh, most definitely, <laughs> yeah. Be a banker. Yeah, exactly. I think, to be honest, he's... Um, obviously, the parents have a lot to do with it. Of course they do. Um, but it's got to be down to the child at the end of the day. They've got to want to do it. Um, and I think it's so easy within our industry for everyone to kind of jump on the bandwagon and say the parents must be pushing the child. When often, um, like what Molly was saying, she wanted to sing as an 11-year-old. She enjoyed singing. It was something that she wanted to do. Um, so she decided to go on to this competition and try and take it further. But we hear that Justin Bieber's management has yeah. signed up. Yeah. 11 year old crews now yeah. they'll only be thinking about one thing surely and it's not not necessarily his best interest well we, look we don't know what they're thinking yeah. about, to be fair yeah, yeah, but yeah. by and large agencies like that agents like that sign up mm -hmm. to make make a living off these people. yeah i mean obviously that's um that's what they're there to do at the end of the day um but hopefully obviously if they're a good management company they will want to kind of build him and nurture him as well and it won't just be about obviously making money um if it was just about that then i'm sure they could just go out there and get him to do one song and that was that kind of thing so hopefully they are going to nurture him and kind of see what happens but i think either way this is a this is a charity single isn't it so Yes, is that, is that a smart move, do you think? I think so, yeah. I think they've, they've obviously thought about that wisely. Um, it's still created backlash, but I think the backlash that it has created has been lessened by the fact that the money is going to charity. Uh, Molly, you know, in the sort of five years or four years uh, since you were on Britain's Got Talent, have you watched it and thought, you know, I'm glad I'm not that person who's here today, gone tomorrow. I'm glad I've just sort of taken my time and perhaps you can wait to launch the career properly? I think I, I think everyone goes on the show for their own reason. And for me, it was just because I had this kind of dream to go on it and maybe pursue, pursue this career. But And a great voice, by the way, let's be <laughs> thank honest. Thank you. Um, but no, I, I look at it and think, look, they're doing that because they maybe want to build their profile. I mean, for me, um, waiting also helped not lose all the fan base from it, but instead of being followed because I'm a girl on Brit's Got Talent, mm. being followed for For who me. you are yeah. and who you are now at 60 and older rather than, uh, you know, being old honey G. Thank you both <laughs> very much indeed. Thank Good to you. see you. Thank Enjoyed you. that. That's just about it from us for now. Claire Nazir has the weather next and Danny is here with updates throughout the evening on Channel 5. For now, thanks for your company. See you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.